If you have your Bibles, if you would, open with me to the Gospel of Mark chapter 3. The Gospel of Mark chapter 3. We're going to begin reading in verse 22. The Gospel of Mark chapter 3. We'll begin reading in verse 22. And if you are able to stand and you're not standing, if you would join us as we read God's Word. Mark chapter 3, verse 22. When you got it, say so. Or we're going to actually go to verse 20. Let's go to verse 20. You're there. But it says this. It says, Then the multitude came together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about it, about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub. And by the ruler of demons, he cast out demons. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Lord, we humble our hearts before your word in these next few moments, asking that you would speak to us, that you give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to your church, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that you would direct our hearts as we enter into this new series. I pray that this would not just be another series that we go through and just scriptures again that we read and hear, but Lord God, that these scriptures would sink deep in our soul and that we would become those who are battle ready, Lord God, who are ready to to stand firm in the evil days in which we live, Lord God, who are ready to stand firm upon the truth for you, for your glory, who are ready to rest in the power of the Spirit of God and who are ready to live for the glory and honor of your name, Lord. We thank you for this. Remove distractions from our minds and our hearts, those of us in this room and those who are online, God. We pray this all in the strong name of Jesus. And everyone said... Amen, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If you do not have an outline, just raise your hand and the ushers will be sure to get you an outline. Be sure that you are able to follow along in the introduction of the sermon and also that you're able to take notes and hopefully take the notes with you home, right? Take the notes with you to think about what it is that we are dealing with. And so today we are starting a new series and the title of the series is Battle Ready. And we're dealing with the topic of spiritual warfare. And so we'll be going over this for the next few weeks. And um, hopefully, hopefully you'll take notes. Hopefully you'll learn and you'll grow in this area, right? Because we find ourselves in spiritual warfare every single day, whether we realize it or not. There is a battle that is raging on around us, and we have to recognize this battle. Now, I know that you are there in the book of Mark, and we're going to and we're gonna stay in the book of Mark, but I want you to just hold your place in Mark, and I want you to go back to the book of Genesis real quick. The book of Genesis, we're going to go to chapter 3, and we're just going to do a quick little journey because I want to I wanna help drive home the point. So we're going to be in chapter 3, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. And Jeff, I'm sorry, I didn't want to overwhelm you this morning, so I didn't give you a heads up up on this, but I'll give you a heads up. We're going to go from chapter three to chapter six. So there it is. I give you a little heads up there, but chapter three, are you in chapter three? Genesis chapter three is easy, easy to find. Genesis chapter three, verse one, look what it says. Are you ready? It says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. Now, just pause for a moment because it's weird that someone is talking to a snake. Has anybody in here ever talked to a snake? And if snake, if a snake started talking to you, you would probably be, um, I don't know, you would think you were hallucinating, or you would be scared, right? Like any, anyway. So it's weird to me, right? Like, but, 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 but again, this is before the fall, right? So, so this serpent begins to speak. Now we know now today who is this serpent? 
This is Satan, right? This is Satan incarnate, right? That is who is present in this moment. And so this isn't just your average serpent, but this is actually Satan. This is the deceiver that is operating through this serpent that is speaking to Eve. But let's go on and look at the story and see what, what happens here. And it, it says that the serpent is more cunning than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, listen to his words, has God indeed said? Has God indeed said? How do you know the enemy is operating in your life? Whenever, whenever God's word is questioned, that's when you know for certain that the enemy is operating in your life. If there's ever any confusion on the matter, whenever something, whenever some voice, whenever something comes to cause you to question what God said, you know that the enemy is in operation. So that's for free. I'm just saying, right? I, that's not in my notes here. Right, but 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 you know this. We know this, and and how to so in culture. Now listen to me for a moment. Let's 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 make this practical. In culture, when voices begin to call into question what God has said, who is in operation? Well, like six people got that. So I just said, whenever a voice comes in that begins to cause you to question, did God really say, or they start saying, or it sounds like this, well, 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 that's the God you serve. That's not the God I serve. So again, whenever, whenever some voice, whenever any voice begins to question, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may, eat of the, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will, you, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God. You hear that? You will be like God. Come on now. Somebody told you, do this and you'll be like God. That would be tempting, wouldn't it? <laughs> do, do, do this and you'll, and you'll be like the one who created everything good that you see. Just, just do this thing. And, and so, so here's the other thing you got to know. You know, how, you know how you know the enemy is operating. It's whenever the enemy starts to point to you like the no of God is because he wants to hold something from you. Understand something. When God says no, it's not because he wants to keep something from you. It's because he wants to keep you from something. Hello. It's not, it's not because he wants to keep you from experiencing something good. It's because he wants to keep you from experiencing something bad. But Satan deceived the woman and, and, and made her believe this lie. So verse 6 says, So when the woman saw that the, that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Notice her husband was with her. <laughs> He was like, go ahead, babe, talk to that snake. <laughs> what, what that snake said, babe? Oh, you, you believe him, baby? Let, let's go on ahead and eat that fruit then. <laughs> My brothers, men of God, don't be passive. <laughs> Married men, don't, don't, don't let the lady run the house. Oh, oh hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, Bishop. This is this not in my notes. We haven't even got to my notes. We haven't even got to the introduction yet. We may not make it there. We may just do marriage counseling from this moment on. Get the devil out of our home. Come on now. Amen. Brothers, don't sit back passive and just, and, and just let wifey make all the decisions. You know, because a happy wife is a happy life. The devil is a liar. I know y'all don't want to hear that stuff, right? Because, because listen, there, there is some truth to that, but don't be a fool now. Come on now. Adam, Adam should have stepped up and said, nah, babe, that, that serpent is a liar. We heard from God. We heard from the Lord. And so, my brothers, we have God's word, and we have a call to leadership, and we shouldn't just be sitting there just eating the fruit because we don't want to cause a riff. That was for free, too. But anyway, we're moving on. Uh -huh. I want, but but I, I want to get to the point here, which is verse 7. Then 
the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The result, the first thing you see die is their innocence because now they know they're naked. Now, now, now they know something. They, they feel shame and they feel fear. Why are we reading this? What does that have to do with spiritual warfare? Well, what I want you to notice is that Satan was there in the beginning of this conversation, and the result of his activity was what? It was now fear. It was now separation from God. I don't know about you, man, but this morning, look, you know, there, there's some, I'll just say it like this. There's some Sundays that for me, like, the music ministry, like, kills it, right? Like, there's just some, like, I feel like the whole, and it may just be for me on that particular Sunday. I don't know what y'all are doing behind me because I got my head this way. Hello. But I, but I just know this much. When, when we were in worship, especially in that second song, and we begin to engage, man, I felt the pre. I wasn't running from God's presence. I wanted more. And then we started singing, I need you more. Come on now. Because we, we know we want the presence of God. We want to experience the pre- We want to experience his love. We want to experience his fullness. But what does Satan want to do? He wants to separate us from the fullness of God. He wants to separate us from the presence of God. So he brings questions to what God's word says. He brings questions to what God's will is. So that way we will eat the fruit, the lie, the deception, and then... We walk in shame, we walk in fear, and worst of all, we run from the presence of God instead of running to him. So that's Genesis 3. Very early on in in the Bible story, turn to Genesis 6. Look at what it says here, verse 6 of chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born and daughters were born to them that the sons of god my belief these are spiritual beings saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose and the lord said my spirit shall not strive with man forever for he is indeed flesh yet his days shall be 120 years now just pause for a moment because we we have something that god apparently bothered him and it's what we read in the preceding verses right there's something happened that wasn't supposed to happen and god is like wait a second man i can't, I can't dwell with him forever so he's got like 120 years to repent. That's what God is saying here. And we know fast forwarding that he goes and, and, and Noah builds this ark in that time frame and then God brings judgment to the earth. But I just want to point out to you what happens here prior to this, verse, verse four. It says, there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward, then the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men were, who were of old men of renown. Then the Lord saw, look at this, The wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord God said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes or found favor, depending on your translation, in the eyes of the Lord. And verse 9, we go on, it reads, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect, now notice this, in his generations. Hmm. Exactly. No, no we, we, we know that Noah was not perfect with the, with the first thing the guy does when he comes out of the ark. He gets drunk. Hello, come on, I'm just saying. Anyway, 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 the point is, what do we see in the text? We see something happening spiritually that is an offense to God that creates what? Chaos in the earth. 
And then we see this evil that is happening that every desire, every intention, all that was going on in man was evil and wickedness. That, that's what was going on. But you know, you know why this is even so important? You know, that, you know what Jesus said about the days before his coming? You know what he said they would be like? The days of Noah. So when we read this text, what do we see happening in our days, in our culture, right now before us? Do you think that it, it, it seems like everything is evil? Turn on, go, go, listen, do this. I, I challenge you to do this. Just do this, right? Just, just be real spiritual, right, for, for the next 30 days. Shut off your phone. Shut off all social media. All y'all just almost collapsed right now. But anyway, here it is. Many of you, and not all, all of you, some of you are like, ah, that doesn't even matter. But, but, but some of us, right, we like, we start to feel some, right, because we just, we can't, we can't disconnect like that, right? But, but anyway, I, I, I just challenge you, right, just shut it all down for, for a month. Don't, don't look at any of it. Just, just like really consecrate yourself to the Lord. Really turn that stuff off. And then when you turn it on in a month, see how you feel. Just, just notice like, oh, what, what, they were saying that? That, that was going, I was looking at this stuff. Yeah, you were. Yes, they have been. And, then, and, and what has happened is slowly but surely we have become desensitized, even as Christians, come on now. We have become desensitized to this wickedness around us, to the ungodliness around us, and we see what is going on in our culture. And, and when we look at the, the picture in the days of Noah, is the exact same thing that we are seeing happening within our days. Look at your outline now. Let's get into the message for today. Hallelujah. One of the greatest deceptions of our days is found in the apparent lack of awareness of spiritual things. Where the enemy has won is in making himself seemingly disappear, and the church is culpable in allowing this deception to gain, gain, gain ground. In an effort to remove ourselves from superstition, which is just another form of witchcraft, you know, like you can't go under a ladder because, you know, you can't step on a crack, you know, you can't, you know, these stupid things, right? Knock on wood, right? Like all that stuff, right? You know, throw some salt over your, you know, all that stupid stuff, right? All, all of those things, and, and you know what, those are just a few, you know, ones that we might all know commonly, but the fact of the matter is there, there's tons of stuff that we grew up with that was just superstitious garbage, and even in the church, there's things that, that, that it's just superstition. It's not, it's not the spirit of God. But in our effort to get away from these superstitious ideas and, and, and then to also get away from the over-spiritualization, like there's a demon behind everything, like a light bulb went out, there's a demon of darkness, right? No, it's a light bulb that needs to be changed. Come on now. Like, like, like everything's a spirit, right? Like, 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 I mean, I, look, you know, I talked about, somebody told me not to talk about food again. I'm going to talk about food again. But, you know, we want to rebuke the spirit of diabetes or we want to rebuke the spirit of high blood pressure. No, change your diet. Hello. I'm, I'm just keeping it 100, right? I mean, just seriously, I, I don't, I don't want to change my diet. I want, I want to keep rebuking those spirits, man, but come on. Like, like at some point, right, like, like we have to realize that not everything is a spirit, but the problem, the problem with us is that we despiritualize everything then. Then we went from the place of, well, I don't want to be superstitious. I want to walk by faith, and I don't want to be over-spiritual, so I don't want to over-spiritualize. And then all of a sudden, we no longer engage in the battle that is before us. So nothing is a demon then. Nothing is spiritual. We live in a modern civilization. The things that you see in the Bible, that's because there wasn't medicine. The reason why you go to third world countries and God does miracles there is because they don't have the same things America has. So basically what we're saying is we don't need God because we got it on our own. We can just give you a pill for that. We can give you a pill for everything. Come on now. There is not one issue that you have or think you have that they don't have a pill to prescribe you with. Hello. They have a prescription for that. But the question is, are they fixing anything or are they just making you <laughs> dependent on this particular thing? Anyway, that's another topic for another day. But here's the thing. We are responsible for what we are seeing. We've moved into the place where our engagement in spiritual warfare is minimal, if existent at all. 
Minimal. We, when we come on a Sunday, you know, or, or, or a small group and we're in prayer and someone around us starts to, you know, they, they, they start to pray intensely, we, we might minimally engage, right? Something goes on really hard in our lives and all of a sudden we call in the prayer warriors. You know what I'm saying? I want you to know something. Before things got really hard in your life, before all hell broke loose, before, th- th- there was plenty of need to engage in spiritual warfare. It's just, it's just there, there was a moment that, that all of a sudden all hell broke, and, and now you started to see the aftermath of your ignorance of the things, of the, of the spirit, of your ignorance. And, and when I say ignorance, I mean dumb. I mean just ignoring the things of the spirit. Just, 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 just not even engaging in the fact that, yo, we don't, we don't just live in a natural realm. Hello. And so here's what I want you to think about this morning. We must biblically engage in the spiritual battle before us if we are to advance the kingdom. We must, we must spir- biblically engage in the spiritual battle before us if we are to advance the kingdom. Now, I, w- I want to I give you a preface of, of what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks because when I talk about spiritually engaging in this battle, the, the one thing that I want you to know, my, when I first became a Christian, the one thing that my mother did teach me well in, in talking about prayer was the, about the armor of God. And, and, and it was something that was extremely important for, for us as believers. And, and from being a new Christian, I had a journal. I don't journal very much now. I don't journal at all now, to be honest. My journal is in my sermons, but uh, I, I don't journal like that. But at that time, I felt like I was learning to pray. And I was learning certain principles of prayer. And so what I did in my journal, I started writing down the things that I knew that I needed to pray every day. And one of the things that I put on there was this armor of God. And see, me coming out of a a lifestyle of gangbanging and seeing my life being in threat and me understanding a little bit about the spiritual components because of some of the things that I was doing, I realized that there was a spiritual battle that was going on. So I knew that I didn't need to like put the armor on like once in a blue. I need to be armored up every single day. And as I, as I was praying for us as a congregation and, and thinking about the church, uh, about this spiritual battle, I realized that, man, we need to be a people who are battle ready. We need to be a people who are armored up every single day. Not some days, but like, like, like you don't leave your house. You, know, you wouldn't walk out your house naked, would you? I hope not. And if you would, thank you for not doing that this morning and, and you know, keeping that at home. But, but, but common, common decency, right, is that you would not leave your home and, and walk out of your home unless you were dressed. And, and, and you, know, so, you know, for some of you, like, I, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll go to Puerto Rico for a moment. But, um, you know, in Puerto Rico, right, you go to the grocery store. Come on now. And, 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 and the women in Puerto Rico in the grocery store, like, they don't go to the grocery, like, y'all, like, I see some of the ladies up in here, like, in, in this area of the world we live in, right? Puerto Rico's a different world. Ladies don't leave their house unless they're all done up, glory to God. I'm just saying, right? Like, 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 that. like they got to look right, right? They got to put the, the makeup on you. And some of y'all are like, y'all are crazy. They, they are crazy. Hello. Come on now. I'm going to pray for our Puerto Rican friends, glory to God. But the point is, right, like, like they, they wouldn't walk out the house not ready, right? When it, for, for me personally, right? Like I, like I love to walk around the house and you know, sandals, stuff like that, and, and just chilling. But when I go out, when I walk out of the house, I always put, I'm like, man, I got to put sneakers on because if something goes down, I got to have stability. I'm just telling you how I think. This is my mindset. Like, I'm not going to walk outside unless I know, right? I know Crocs, they got like that run mode, but I don't know if that run mode <laughs> is like fight mode, you know what I'm saying? I'm just keeping it, you know, I... But nonetheless, you, you, uh, what I, I think about these things, right? And so spiritually, the same thing has to happen with us. Like you and I need to know that every single day of our lives, we are walking into battle. It may not seem like it. And listen, if you think about wars, there were days that, there, that, that it seemed like there wasn't a battle going on in some of these wars in history. It wasn't every, there's usually a period of time where there was like intense fighting, but there are moments where it seems like there's peace. And that's where the enemy wants to catch you. He wants to catch you in those moments that it seems like, oh, it's, you know, my life is not that bad. And, 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 and listen, don't get it twisted. It's not, it, it, <laughs> he gets us when it's our peace. 
Because if we look at our world, if we, if we look at our world, if we look outside of our little bubble, if, if we look outside of our, uh, you know, our four walls of our home, if we look at, there's always war going on. It's like being in Israel, right? You know, you hear about this stuff, but, um, you know, you and I, we don't, we don't even understand this. But from what I understand, you go to Israel, and, man, there's bombing happening every single day. What's, what's the purpose of the Iron Dome over there, right? It's to stop all the bombing that, it, do we live like that? No, we don't live like that. <laughs> I mean, you, you hear a loud bang, and you're like, oh, my goodness, right? Like the end of the world, right? Especially if you live in a nice neighborhood, you're like, well, that wasn't normal. <laughs> now, you're in the hood, that's like, oh, that's just, you know, that's whatever. These people are crazy, you know. <laughs> it's too quiet around here if we ain't hearing a few of those, you know, and sirens and all the. <laughs> but the thing is, we, we get caught up in, well, Lord, as long as me and mine are blessed. As long as me as, long as, me and mine have peace. As long as me and mine are okay. Oh, you're not okay. You're just not engaged in the battle. And one day that battle is going to come to your home and you're, you're going to be like, oh, I need to come to prayer service all of a sudden. Hello. I know y'all don't want to hear that, but it, it's the truth. It's the truth. Hell breaks loose and where do you, you know where to run. You should run to the body of Christ. You should run to your prayer warrior friend. You should run to connect with the church when you're going through it. But here's the thing. No, listen, if you're taking notes, you should write this down. Let me tell you why corporate prayer is so important all the time. You, listen to me now. You should come to corporate prayer like your life and your family depend on it because somebody's does. Y'all didn't hear me. You should participate in corporate prayer as though your life or your family depends on it because somebody's does. It's not about you and me only. It's not about just the breakthrough that I need. What about my brother? What about my sister that is experiencing hell breaking loose in their life? Where are you at to intercede for them? Oh, your bubble's good. Your space is fine. So there's no urgency to run, to gather, to do those things. Again, that's all part of spiritual warfare. It's part of engaging in this battle that we are supposed to be engaged together in as a people of God. And so again, what I want to hopefully convey, and, I, and, and I'm saying this now, I'll say this at the end of the sermon again. But as we look at Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, and we'll go, we'll go through this over the next few weeks, and we'll, we'll, we'll break this apart looking at the armor of God. But as we go through that, here is my challenge to you. My challenge to you is to make it a point moving forward that you spend time reading through Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, and that every morning before you leave your house, out of your prayer, that you put the armor of God and you be reminded that you are engaged in a battle. And that battle may not be for the peace of your home. It may be for the peace of your brother's and sister's home. It may be for the salvation of others that you are engaged in this battle for them. And so the first thing I'll ask you to repeat after me is this. And we got a lot of ground to cover. We already covered a lot of ground, but we want to get into this. And so the first thing I'll ask you to repeat after me is this. Say, recognize, recognize. The, battle the battle we are in. Yeah. So the first thing we got to do if we're going to engage in this battle is we have to recognize the battle. And this morning, I want to talk to you about being, uh, about being more than aware, but being engaged. That's been my word of the year, right? Engaged. To be, to be engaged. And so it, it's more than just being aware that there's a battle going on, but, but to ensure that we are actually engaged in this battle. So recognize the battle that we are in. So look at verse 22 now. I just want to jump there really quickly. And, and the context here, I don't have time to get into every single thing, but Mark is like, you know, hits, hits the road running. He's like, you know, he, he's, he, he's a speed speaker. I, 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 that's what I, the way I think about Mark. He's like, he, do, he doesn't worry about genealogy. He's like, boom, 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 boom. I and mean, he's just dropping it, right? And so he comes to this point in verse 20 there, uh, Jesus has come back. And, and if you read just, if you look at chapter three, I mean, you see Jesus, he's in the temple on the Sabbath day. He's about to heal someone. The people are looking at him like, yo, what are you going to do in this moment? You're going to heal? And he decides to heal somebody on the Sabbath. So he does something. I don't even understand that because it's kind of like, what is church for, right? Isn't church supposed to be a hospital, right? Is it, isn't church supposed to be? No, it seemed, like the, it seemed like the synagogue was the place that the more spiritual came and they puffed their chests out about how spiritual they were and those who were sick and those who were broken. You see, you need God. But Jesus was like, yeah, they're right. They need God. That's why I'm here. 
I'm going to bring healing to their lives. And so Jesus brings healing to this person's life. Multitudes are coming to him. Demons are being cast out. Jesus chooses his, 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 his 12, and, and, he, and he, he calls them, he empowers them, and, he's, and, and he, he gives them the ability to cast out demons and all of these beautiful things that are happening. And then there comes this moment that it's time for them to rest. And the scripture shows that they go there, verse 20. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. There was such a mighty move of God happening and these people wanted it so badly that when Jesus and his disciples were actually in a moment of rest, they were bombarding them. And the disciples and Jesus couldn't even eat. And so they continue to minister. His family thinks that he's crazy. And then we come to verse 22 and it, and, and it says this, and the scribes came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub. And by the ruler of demons, he cast out demons. I want you to notice something. The accusation of the scribes, the religious leaders of the day, is that the miracles of Je that Jesus were performing, that those miracles were either divine or demonic. It, it wasn't like, oh, these things are fake. No, no, they, 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 there was no question to the validity of what was happening. The question was, is this divine? Is this God doing it? Or is this demonic? Is this Satan doing something? This is the argument that is there. What was happening was there was a kingdom collision that was taking place in this moment. After 400 years of silence, all of a sudden, John the Baptist comes on the scene. He begins to preach, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then one day he sees Jesus walking and he's he says, behold, the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sin of the world, baptizes Jesus. Jesus gets baptized, and what does Jesus start preaching? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The king, there was two kingdoms that were colliding. The kingdom that we saw in Genesis, the kingdom of darkness that was meant to bring chaos, that was meant to bring confusion. The kingdom that was meant to bring destruction was at work manifesting itself in, 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 in ways of oppression and sickness and disease. And Jesus comes on the scene and he heals a guy. He heals people. He delivers. I mean, he brings a power that has not been seen yet. This is what is occurring. A kingdom that is liberating. A kingdom that is all powerful. A kingdom that is a restorative kingdom was now moving in that region. How many of y'all know God wants that same kingdom power moving today? He does. He does, but we got to be engaged. So unquestionably, something powerful was happening. The truth is, here's the truth. The truth is the same kingdom of darkness is at work today. Hello. The same kingdom of darkness is at work today, pulling the strings of our government, pulling the strings of our entertainers, pulling the strings of our education system, pulling the strings of our activist, of, of activist groups, pulling the strings even of, of, of pastors and, and churches, which is sad, but pulling the strings of any place where, the, where, where, the, where, where, where you see the anti-God influence, anti-Bible influence, anti-Christianity influence. But here's what I want to encourage you with. Romans 6, 10, uh, ver, 6, 10 through 11 says this it says the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you come on now and just as God raised Christ from the dead he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you so here's what I see just as we see the kingdom of God moving in power then God desires his kingdom to move in power now but here's the thing we have to recognize the battle that we're in for that to happen because if we think now, there's not really a battle going on. There's, there's not really, a, not just, it's, it's not that there's a battle going on. It's that we think that the only thing we're in is a culture war. That's what we think. That, that's what we've been deceived to believe, that we're just in a culture war. Oh, no, no. The stakes are much higher. That's my second point. But, but, but I want you to, we have to realize that we're engaged in the spiritual battle. So, so, so here's the question. The question is, is the Bible clear about this battle that we are in. Is the Bible clear? Yes. So just, just in case the rest of you that didn't shout yes, just in case you weren't convinced, I want, you, I want you to take notes on some scriptures because I want you to see what the writers of the New Testament had to say specifically about Satan and evil. And, that, and I just look at this. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 18. It says this. It says, therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but... Who is that? Satan hindered us. Hold on a second. Satan hindered the apostle? Yes. That's what he said. That's not what I said. 
I'm just reading you. I'm, I'm just reading to you what he wrote to the church of Thessalonica. He said, I wanted to come to you many times, but Satan hindered us. Okay. First Peter five, verse eight, be, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary who walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour because your adversary, the devil, this is, so you got two apostles, the apostle Paul and the apostle Peter have already spoken clearly in terms of Satan and his work, the devil and the things that he does. James, the brother of Jesus. He writes his book. Look what he says, verse 4, chapter 4, verse 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the? And he will flee from you. Okay, so now you've got three apostles. So the scripture says that every word be established by two or three witnesses. You have three apostles here. We'll get to one other one, the apostle John. He'll be the last one I quote. But I want us to go back and I want to look at some other things that the apostle Paul has to say with regards to Satan. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. Verse five. Again, we're running through a lot of scripture here. Give you some context. He's speaking to married couples. Married couples. And as he's speaking to married couples, he's giving them advice in their marriages. And these are the words that the Apostle Paul writes. He says, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time. He's obviously talking about sexual intimacy. That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And then he says, come together again so that does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, why do I point the scripture out? Because I want to point out to you the places where, where, where God actually inspired someone to write in the New Testament where Satan can show up. So if you're married, if you're not married, stop doing it. Hello. If you're not married, no, you don't have a license until you have a marriage license. Hello. And it's signed, glory to God. But, but, but if you are married, this is where the enemy, okay, I, I, we, we got to keep moving. The next chapter in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. See then, that, oh, I'm sorry, Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to anger. And for us guys, you know, one of, the, one, one of the biggest things that a lot of us men struggle with is anger. Well, you, 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 so so we, we can be angry. I mean, anybody, anybody get angry? And I know some ladies, they struggle with this too. I'm just saying. I'm just going to say that. Uh-huh. Uh. But do you sin in your anger? You cuss someone out in your anger. You smack someone in the face in your anger. Okay, I'm just saying, right? <laughs> what, what, what other things do you do in your anger? He says, be angry. It's okay to be angry. Listen, did you hear me? It is okay to be angry. There is no issue with being angry. The issue is when you sin in your anger. And even worse, when you allow that stuff to just fester inside of you, you don't reconcile with anyone, you don't ask for forgiveness, and then the sun sets, and it's like cement, and then Satan does what? One, one trans translation says, don't give Satan a foothold. And it's like, while you were sleeping in your anger, it was like something was being built, and Satan is just standing right there like, oh, I got you now. We got to keep moving. Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The days that we live in are evil. So we have seen the apostles John, I mean the, the apostle James, the apostle Peter, the apostle Paul, they've made it crystal clear that, listen, Satan is a factor within the life of the believer. There is a spiritual battle that is going on. There is an enemy who is actively involved in seeking to make you fall, to trip you up, to hinder your witness. Can I just tell you really quickly what the whole thing is about? It's not about you. It's not about your peace. It's not about your happiness. It is about the mission of God not being a Accomplished. The reason why the enemy is so actively involved against us is not because he wants to make you have a bad day. Hello. It's not because he wants to give you, you know, a, a, a bad moment or a bad experience. It's because he wants to hinder you from being a witness that God wants you to be. 
So if he can get you caught up in sins of anger, if he can get you caught up in sins of lust, if he can get you caught up in sins of lying and deception, if he can get you caught up in those sins, guess what? He's tripped you up and hindered you from doing what God called you to do. The last verse that we'll go to in this section, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. These, this is very, very important for us to grasp. We know that we are of God and that the, say, whole world. No, no, no. Whole world. There, thank you. The whole world. Not, not, not some of the world. The whole world. Lies under the sway of the wicked one. He didn't say some of the world. He didn't say parts of the world. He didn't say the parts that you think are cute. Now, those aren't under the sun. No, no. He said the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The NIV says under the control of the wicked one. The ESV says under the power of the wicked one. The, new, 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 um, the new, NASB says it is, it is in the power of the, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Are we not engaged in a battle? That's the whole point. We got to recognize the battle that we're in. See, if we live as though the enemy doesn't exist, we have given him the ground needed to steal, to kill, and to destroy, and that's what he wants. And so we have to recognize that. The second thing I'll ask you to feed after me is this. Say, recognize the stakes of the battle we are in. Recognize the stakes of the battle we are in. So Jesus goes on, look at verse 23. He says this, so he called them to himself and said to them in parables, how can Satan stand against or cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. So what does Jesus do? The scribes come down. They say he has Beelzebub. He's casting out demons by the, by, by the ruler of demons, right? He, he's, he, he has this power. This, it's, it's more magical than supernatural. It's, it, 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 it's, it's something that, that look, it, it's just Satan is disguising himself to try to give him prominence. And what Jesus says, man, that's ridiculous. Let me give you a little parable about this. And he talks about, it doesn't make sense. Satan rising up against Satan, he's not going to do that. Why would he do that? He's, he's not going to give up ground. He's not going to fake that. He's, he's going to take ground. And so he, he, he makes this crystal clear for all of us. So here's, here's the bottom line. What is he trying to say in this little parable here? Division is the end of the intended purpose of any kingdom or household. Are you here? If Satan can make your house, your home divided, guess what? He wins. Because the purpose that God has, it will be destroyed. Because you will not accomplish it. If any kingdom is divided, I mean, y'all have seen movies. I mean, you, you know history. Man, people try. You know what? We're going to kill this guy. There's division within that kingdom, and then sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The bottom line is, if, if, if a kingdom rises against a kingdom, if a power rises against a power, he, he makes it crystal clear. This is absolutely ridiculous. What is our purpose? Again, the, the Satan, Satan rules a kingdom of what? Deception, destruction, and, and distress. Jesus leads a kingdom of what? Truth, restoration, and freedom. Our purpose, again, I want you to hear this, our purpose as the heirs of the kingdom of God and members of the household of faith. Now, y'all know that, right? We're part of the kingdom of God. You are, you are a kingdom kid, right? When you were washed and you were, and you were born again, you were brought into the kingdom of God. Now you are an heir in this kingdom. But you're also a son or a daughter as part of the family of God. And as such, you have a responsibility in order to do what? To extend and advance the values and virtues of the kingdom of heaven in the earth in what? The power of the Holy Spirit. Not your power. Not my power. So what are the stakes? What, what is at stake? Okay, we already know that the purpose of the kingdom is at stake. But let's look at a few more scriptures here so we can see what's really at stake. John chapter 10, verse 10 through 21. Now you know this verse. I'm just going to read through it here because what I want you to see is what's at stake if we allow the enemy to have his way. John 10, 10 through 21, it says this. It says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I'm just going to leave it right there. 
the first thing that we see is that the life of God intended for us is at stake. Now, 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 I don't want you to get it twisted. I'm not, I'm not talking about your best life yet, like, you know, that, that book that's out there. I'm not, that, that, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm, I know, I know, I know, you know, the, the smiley preacher on TV, he makes you smile. He makes you feel good about yourself. I know. And, 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 and he gets you going. Like, he gets your engine moving. Like, yes, I'm ready to, to, to attack the day. Okay, great. Listen. Listen. <laughs> Here's, here's, here's what we have to understand. What we have to understand, what we have to grasp is that Jesus did come to give us abundant life. He did come to give us a full life, but not a life that's filled with what we want, a life that's full of what he wants. There's a difference. I, listen, I cannot name and claim everything. I can do that all day long, and you know, listen, it may work, but I'm, I'm telling you what, that's not God. I know, I know, I offended some people. It's okay, I still love you. The fact of the matter is, I can't just put a, you know, this, this, I'm gonna I'm have a vision. I'm, I'm, all, I'm down with vision boards for the right reasons. Y'all. Are you hearing me? But I'm gonna have a vision board. I'm gonna put that car that I want. I'm gonna keep seeing that every day I claim you. Where, where is that in the scriptures? I don't, I don't find that in God's word. How about, how about on that vision board, you, you, you put your, your marriage. Lord, I declare wholeness in this place. Lord, Lord, I declare myself to be a husband who loves my wife as Christ loves the church. For the wives in the room, I declare myself to be a wife that is submissive to my husband as the church submits to Christ. I know every woman said amen. Lord, yeah, right? How about, how about if we put our kids on that vision board? We put their names there and we said, Lord, these children are children of covenant because of the covenant you made with me. I, I, I pray over them your covenant promises, your covenant pl- See, those are, that's the abundant life that God wants us to have. You, you put your job on that vision board and you declare, Lord, help me to bring the joy. Help me to bring the peace. Help me to bring the love. Lord, I declare your kingdom in these places where I see that is what I'm that That's the abundant life that God wants us to have. But when we, 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 we put these fake garbage vision boards together and we sit there and we meditate on them for 10 minutes and we're going to get what we want because we're bringing it in. That's, that ain't no secret. That's a deceiving lie. Stop believing the lie. See, because you know what happens? When those, you know, do, you, do you know how many people's faith has been shipwrecked because of that stupidity? So what's at stake? The faith of people, their lives, their families, their hope in God because they're believing God for a lie. And just because the preacher got up and he could articulate it really well, and because he's driving that and because he's living there, all of a sudden, well, it must be true. No, it doesn't have to be true. Listen, check me. I'm giving you all these scriptures because I want you to go back and read them all. In their context, read the full check. Check it. Listen, if I'm wrong, come back and be like, Bishop, listen, I know you were passionate, however... I just want you to reconsider your thoughts in this area. I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. As long as you read the text, as long as you dug in, as long as you did your homework, you didn't come to me saying, Bishop, I wasn't feeling, I don't care what you're feeling. I, I'm not necessarily feeling everything I'm saying either. Hello. But it's true. The second thing, second thing that, I, that I'll point out to you that is at stake, and it ties in with this point, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 1 through 2, look what it says. It says, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. The Spirit makes it crystal, crystal clear. Crystal clear. That there's coming a time, and that time is now, when people will give heed to deceiving spirits because they want to hear what they want to hear. They want somebody to affirm what is in them in the name of God. I 
How many of you know that there are creeds in the church? Creeds. In a few weeks, we're going to learn about a, a particular creed that is helpful in our engagement in spiritual warfare. Because it goes in with what we were talking about in worship. I believe. There's power in that. Remember what I just said, right? What's at stake? What's at stake? Doctrine. The gospel. The truth that is able to set people free. Well, there's a new creed that is out there, and it's called the Sparkle Creed. Now, I want you to know something. All these creeds that are older, right, like the Apostles' Creed, right, it, it is not by the apostles, right? The apostles, it's not them who wrote that, but it is very old, like, like very old. So people were debating faith, and they came out with these creeds to help us to remember faith. Now, now, now according to what I understand, the Sparkle Creed came out around 2021. I want you to hear the Sparkle Creed. I believe in the non-binary God whose pronouns are plural. I believe in Jesus Christ, their child, who wore a fabulous tunic and had two dads and who saw everyone as a, a, as a sibling child of God. I believe in the rainbow spirit who shatters our image of one white light and refracts it into a rainbow of gorgeous diversity. I believe in the church of everyday saints, as numerous, creative, and resilient as patches on the AIDS quilt, whose feet are grounded in mud, and whose eyes gaze at the stars in wonder. I believe in the calling of each of us, that love is love is love. So beloved, let us love. I believe, glorious God, help my unbelief. Why, why, why is this, why would I even read that? Because this wasn't just at some corner store somewhere. This is being declared from pulpits all over the place. In the name of God. So what's at stake? These are doctrines of demons. These are deceiving spirits who are engaged in the culture in which we live, who are pulling the strings of everything that we see going on, and just because we don't have a temple erected to that God in name, we're still worshiping them in our behavior. See, here's the thing. When the doctrines of God are diluted and distorted, when the truth of God is rejected, there is no hope for the freedom that this world needs. You understand me? There is no, you know why? I don't need to change. I don't need to repent. I don't need to turn. I can keep being a liar and God is cool with that. I can keep being an adulterer and God is cool with that. I can keep being a cheater and God is cool with that. I can keep, I can, whatever, just fill in the blank. I can keep doing what I like. I can keep sinning how I want to sin because the non-binary God who has plural pronouns, he accepts us all just like we are. And we don't have to change. My friends, this is blasphemy. But I, but, but I want you to know it's not just blasphemy, but it is demonically inspired blasphemy. Bottom line is that God has given us a message, not just words, but a kingdom message with kingdom authority that the enemy can hinder, especially when we are ignorant of his plans, he uses us, or when we are passively disengaged in the battle, we give up ground willingly, just like Adam did in the garden. And church, here's the thing that I hope that you are hearing. We must break free from the spiritual lethargy that has made us easy prey and weak adversaries for the wicked one. We have to break free. How do we break free? By repentance. By recognizing, man, I, I haven't been engaged in this battle. I, I, I've been sitting on the sidelines. I've been acting like, well, everything is just this or it's just that, or it doesn't really matter. No. I, I've got to engage in this battle. And the first way that I do that is by humbling myself before the Almighty God. By recognizing that there is a battle and by recognizing what is at stake. The third thing 
Please repeat this after me. Recognize the victor of the battle we are in. Recognize the victor of the battle we are in. This morning we sang that song, He Wears the Victor's Crown. He is victorious. He is seated high above all authority, all power, and all dominion. And what we have to realize is, yes, the battle is real, but our Savior has won. So, so, so we're not fighting from a place of despair. I hope you feel the weight of this because here's the problem with my Christian friends, and I love you dearly. You know that Jesus has the victory. You know that Jesus won the fight, so you don't have to fight no more. That's the lie. That's the deception. I, the, the reason why I read these other scriptures in my first point is because I want you to know that no apostle, that no writer of the New Testament just said, well, Jesus has the victory, so don't worry about fighting. Don't worry about submitting to God and resisting the devil. Don't worry about that. Jesus gave you the victory. Why would James even say that if it didn't matter? So we need to reckon, but, but, but here's the thing. We don't walk around trying to fight these demons on our own, right? Hello? We don't walk around trying to do this in our own strength and our own ability, but we fight this fight according to the weapons that God has given us. And so really quickly, looking at verse 27, verse 27 says this, and I'm not going to get into the, the whole blasphemy thing. All I want to say is that there are things that are blasphemy in our day. There, there are things that are blasphemy. In our, there, are, there are people in this context, what they were doing was they were attributing the work of God as the work of Satan. That was blasphemy because they knew better. When you reject God and you say, nope, I don't need that Savior. When you reject God, nope, I don't need his work in my life. When you reject God and say you don't, then that is what blasphemy looks like in our days. What, these, what, what I just read to you a moment ago, that's blasphemy in our days. But I want you to focus on this verse. No one can enter, verse 27, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. So Jesus' parable is ending right with this thought here, which is, Satan can't be divided against Satan. A, a kingdom can't be divided against the kingdom. And a house cannot be divided against a house. If they're going to stand, no, they won't stand. There will be an end. But, but what happens is what Jesus is saying is, oh, yeah, I'm the authority. But I love the way that, that Luke writes this. Look what Luke says. He says this in, in Luke. He says, um, he says when, a, when a strong man fully armed, this is, this is the same verse Luke is just giving, the nuance that he gives. When a strong man fully armed guards his own, own palace, his goods are in peace. That makes sense, right? When, when you're standing guard, there ain't nobody coming in this house, right? When you're ready, well, when you're sleeping, it's a totally different thing. But when a stronger, I love that. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Jesus makes it clear. He is a stronger. He is the stronger one. I, I, I don't have to sit here. Listen now, and, and, and this is going to tie right into some of our spiritual warfare mentality. I don't, have to, I don't have to bind the strong man. Guess who already bound the strong man? He did. I, I don't have to do that. I, I need to declare what Jesus has already done. Oh, to be sure. I, I need to be like in the book of Jude where, he, where they're fighting over the body of Moses and he doesn't even rise up against his angelic host and say, I rebuke you. What does he say? The Lord rebuke you. His, the, even the angel was like, hold on. I don't, I don't need to take this authority on myself. He's, he's saying the power is in the Lord. And so what we have to realize is that the strong man, Satan, has been disarmed. If you don't believe me, let's look at the scriptures. Let's see what the scriptures teach us on this. So it seems, right, at, at times, and I know that it seems at times that we're losing, that we're in a losing battle, that there's no hope, there's no end in sight. However, it is important that we know what position you and I are engaging this battle from. What's our position? So first scripture here, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. Look what it says. It says, and I'm going to just run through these. You can write them down. First, um, Philippians 2, 5 through 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which also is in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, say therefore, 
Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what does Philippians tell us? Jesus earned the victory over our adversary and the one who we must bow to to ensure we experience the temporal... Hey there, thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. I hope that your time with us was helpful. Hope that your time with us was edifying to you. And I just wanna say thank you for all of your support. Thank you for the likes, thank you for the shares, thank you for the comments. If you are joining us for the first time online, would you please do us a favor and either email me at bishop at corefaithchurch.org. That is bishop at corefaithchurch.org. So I can thank you for being with us, get to know you a little bit better. Or if you have a prayer request, you can also email me there. Or if you're on Facebook, you can go ahead Ahead and you can leave us a message here uh, directly in the comment section, or you can send us an instant message and we'll get that and respond to you as soon as we can. Lastly, I want to say thank you to all of your to all of you for your financial support. And if you would like to contribute to Core Faith financially, there's a simple way to do it. You can give electronically. All you have to do is text Core Faith. That is one word. Core Faith to 73256. That is Core Faith, one word, to 73256, and then follow the prompts, and you can be a financial supporter of the mission that God has given us. And if you are supporting us financially, I want to say thank you so much. I pray that God will bless you abundantly. God bless you. Hope to see you next week. <laughs>